Laura, in your new quarterly essay, you write that Australia is disenchanted with its politicians like never before, despite being a stable and generally wealthy uh, and comparatively very prosperous nation. Have we set our expectations of our politicians too high? I think we've set our expectations about politicians a bit too high and I think that is in turn a reflection of the fact we've set our expectations too high of government, by which I mean not just politicians but what the state, if you like, or what individual parts of the administration of the government might be. Um, it's been a long-term trend, is, is my argument in the essay, um, that we have this very paternalistic relationship with, with the state um, and politicians as representatives of that um, are expected to be all things to all people, but overall they're supposed to be um, a slightly avuncular, um, reassuring, and when they're not those things, we get very disconcerted. Our politicians have, have been of us, but not of us in a way. And uh, in the essay, I talk about the first fleet, about how it was an autocratic, bureaucratic society, about how when uh, the convicts were starving, they pragmatically thought, well, um, Philip and, uh, and his establishment will make sure that we don't starve rather than going out and doing something for themselves. Um, that has been a really strong thread because people didn't really see themselves as an independent body, particularly uh, right through the 19th century. There was a push for more independence from Britain, but that's a slightly different thing. And there was always this scrabbling to get a few more uh, bits of um, autonomy, if you like, from a centrally controlled place. Um, plus the fact that the economy grew in such huge surges, particularly with the uh, mining boom in the mid-19th uh, century. Um, there was this huge role for the state in providing a lot of infrastructure and to a lot of people that meant that it was also there to provide jobs when things went bust, which in a boom and bust economy like ours was quite often. So what about the cynicism, that, that element? Where, how does that play into the, the kind of relationship that that we have with our government? Well, I think there have been a whole range of reasons for that. Um, I think you perhaps are less cynical if, if you believe that you've been part of the process of uh, electing uh, people into office or if you uh, actually feel really galvanised by the debates. Um, but we've had sort of some strange uh, periods in history. For example, once again, going back to the 19th century, uh, we had this gradual evolution of um, of uh, voting rights and of of the parliament, particularly in New South Wales, um, and all the leaders of society were originally consulted by the governor. They eventually went up to the upper house in New South Wales, and you had every man people uh, being elected to the parliament. And because there'd been this disconnect um, with uh, with politics in a way, because we hadn't had a democracy in place, people saw uh, people like themselves being elected to politics and they thought it was good, but they also were very deeply cynical about them and they weren't regarded as being real real politicians or real leaders as, as, as the sort of toffee types had been. And I think that goes right through to the current day. People, are, people don't have a relationship with the state. I say, you know, if you asked... Australians what they could do for their country, they'd look at you blankly mostly beyond the defence uh, realm or the public service. So they don't understand, they really don't get why politicians want to do uh, politics. Mm. They can only see it in terms of the sort of human dramas that uh, focus so much of the media attention. They can't really understand why you'd want to go in there and think that you'd actually make a difference. I guess it's possible that this cynicism or scepticism actually has positive benefits in the sense that uh, politicians need to be on their toes, mm. that there's no one ever has, uh, no one's ever off the leash. No one's ever off the leash. Um, they, it's, 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 it's interesting to me how uh, some politicians continually hope that they will get somebody saying, yes, you did a great job there because it happens so rarely. Um, I, I particularly have in mind the treasurer, Wayne Swan, on this. I mean, he's been a party apparatchik, you know, been through all the cynical stations of life as, uh, as the political process throws it up. But yet he always gets so infuriated because sometimes we do actually have good economic numbers and nobody ever says, you know, you've, you've done a good job or you've helped that. 
So it, it is quite interesting that some of them just assume that they will never get any uh, recognition or reward for what they've done, which I think uh, is a good thing. That, I think it's a good thing that they are prepared to do it despite that. Uh, but some of them, you know, it, they, they can never get over the fact that you'd think that somebody would recognise that we're at least trying to do the right thing. Joe Hockey recently gave a speech about our culture of entitlement uh, and he implied that we need to reduce our expectations of government. But you write in, in the quarterly essay that it was his party under John Howard that did more than any other government to entrench the current mm. sense of entitlement. Mm. Could, could you explain what you meant by sure. this? Sure. Um, well, I suppose that in the essay I'm talking about two different levels of the uh, sort of sense of entitlement. I think there is a sort of a broad sense that we think that uh, we're entitled to a pretty good life here in Australia and we think everybody else is getting one, so we, why shouldn't we, which is fair enough. And then there's this explicit uh, talk of sort of the age of entitlement under John Howard, um, Hawke and Keating pushed the idea of reform on the basis of we, we will make these changes to the economy, we will help uh, ease the uh, burden of those changes upon you, uh, but they're for the communal good. John Howard changed the political rhetoric and, and the um, expectations of people. He made the relationship with uh, the government, a very much a personal one, um, and as the boom in the resources sector took off um, t 10 years ago, uh, it really started to uh, become clear what his modus operandi was. He uh, gave lots of direct cash handouts to voters, <coughs> excuse me, rather than uh, supporting institutions, for example, subsidising private health insurance rather than putting lots of money into the uh, hospital system. Um, he gave tax cuts uh, as a standard thing, um, which he said was a sign that he was running a small government, when in fact a lot of the things that he'd put in place, things like the baby bonus, the family tax benefit scheme being extended up the income scales, they have created an expectation amongst people that there is something for them uh, from government and that it comes in the form of cash. And uh, people will say to you, um, well-educated people who are on high incomes, who you wouldn't have previously expected would be thinking they'd get something from the government. Um, somebody told me an anecdote recently that they said, well, some of my friends were complaining, well, I'm really unhappy that they're taking the private health insurance rebate away from me because that was the only thing I got from the government. And to me, that's a real shame because it takes us back um, away to before Hawke and Keating um, and to little patches of policy where there was this expectation that the state would look after you. What do you think our leaders might have done differently since, since the Howard years, including Howard, to prevent, to stop this sense of growing entitlement, uncontrollable expectations? Uh, well, I suppose what they could have done was really just put a cap on it. Um, now, to some extent, the culture was set up by the uh, circumstances at the time. We were, f we were having this, the government was having these sort of rivers of gold of, uh, of tax revenue coming in, and suddenly it seemed that you could give all these, all these uh, huge handouts out. But it was always pretty apparent, if you had a pragmatic look at it, that that wouldn't happen. So uh, in a political sense, what you could have done was started to change the language to say, well, we don't actually have all that much money and it's not prudent to be always uh, giving this money out. We've got to think about the longer term. Now, uh, Howard and Peter Costello made, uh, lip, paid lip service to that with the Future Fund, but they could have started to uh, moderate the amount they gave out. In fact, the, money, the amounts of money and the reasons why people got it just kept on growing and growing. Um, I think a, a sign of how hard it is to turn that around is that um, the Rudd and Gillard governments have been taking small steps to start winding middle class welfare back, but they don't advertise them. You know, they really are very reluctant to say, look, enough is enough, we can't afford this, we've got to wind it back. They'll just take these tiny little steps and hope that nobody notices um, at, at the edges. Though to some extent people will, will say, we're all angry because our leaders are actually so terrible. Mm. Gillard knifed our mm. previous mm. leader. Tony Abbott hasn't had a pos positive contribution since mm. he became opposition leader. Mm. Do you think it's possible without these factors, do you think it's possible that we wouldn't actually be having this conversation? Well, I suppose 
in the essay, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we have a particular little uh, knot of anger uh, that flows from the circumstances of the current uh, parliament. Um, and I try to put those in the context of these longer term trends about entitlement. But without a doubt, I think um, Julia Gillard uh, is disliked because of the knifing of Kevin Rudd. Um, and I also quote uh, a social researcher, Rebecca Huntley, who says, in fact, they hate her because she's the embodiment of minority government, which they don't like, because not only did she knife Kevin Rudd, but she ran a really bad election campaign, and that was the re reason why we've got minority government. And Australians hate minority government. They, they, they don't like that much more than they don't like Julia Gillard. They don't like the uncertainty of it. Um, as we are discussing before, they like government to be... Uh, reliable and uh, safe and to not necessarily give them vision, I think the vision thing's been a bit overstated, but to give them a sense of um, certainty about their lives. And when government itself is so uncertain, uh, they really resent um, that sort of uh, uncertainty being imposed upon them. Do you think rather than having leaders that are consultative and, uh, you know, that approach reform by... Uh, seeking policy consensus, etc. Perhaps what we're actually looking for is just a strong leader who'll push things in and will be angry at the time, but then afterwards will say, no, actually, they were a good leader. Um, I think there's probably a middle course. Um, I think there uh, there is a lot to be said for the power of uh, persuasion, that people are prepared to be persuaded on things. Um, it requires a real confidence, a real deft political touch, um, and uh, and a, being able to uh, c p convince people that you're not going to blink. Um, it doesn't mean ram, ram, uh, railroading things through. Um, it does mean that you're going to have to say to people up front, look, you're not going to like this, but we're going to do it. A really good example is um, the Enterprise Migration Agreements controversy of the last couple of weeks. I mean, this was one of those really classic things where you, you wonder how the government got it wrong. Um, the policy had been discussed in a working group which had included business and trade unions. Some of the trade unions uh, were the ones who were yelling the loudest in the, in the last couple of weeks. It had gone through this incredibly exhaustive consultative process. It had been announced uh, in the 2011 budget, so it wasn't a big surprise. Uh, but it was only controversial because it involved uh, Gina Reinhart's Roy Hills project and because of who it was and which project it was, everybody got very excitable. But instead of just saying to um, the trade unions in the room, uh, when she met with them privately, um, look, this is Julia Gillard, look, you know this is happening, uh, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> um, we're going to do this, it's good, you've got lots of things to sell, there are 6,000 onshore jobs, you know, it'll be a huge boost for, um, for local content, blah, blah, blah. And instead of that, she panicked and ran away from it and ruined the capacity to sell this as a, as a good government initiative, which a lot of people support uh, in the community and in the business sector. Another point that's often been made is that there's been a, a shift in the way that the media has operated mm. in the past five years. Mm -hmm. Do you think this has affected the, the temperature of, of public expectations towards politicians? Oh, oh yeah. I in the way, I'm... Lindsay Tanner, he mm. wrote this book, Sideshow, mm. where he, he sort of slated home a lot of the blame towards the media in how they sensationalise issues and yeah. how it's more and more difficult to speak about reform in a yeah. detailed way. Do you agree with the way that he put it? I agree with a lot of what Lindsay says. Um, I think the media is culpable in a lot of ways. Um, I don't. Some of it is deliberate and um, malevolent and some of it is just uh, we're as bamboozled, I think, by the speed of our own uh, industry um, and the 24-hour news cycle as everybody else. But it certainly is true uh, that I think, on the one hand, I, I tell the story about how when I was a, a young journalist, um, there was a inquiry going on to how we'd uh, re reform the financial system, which essentially became the blueprint for what we did do in the 1980s. And in those days, 
the Financial Review had a journalist follow the committee around the country and listen to all the public inquiries uh, and hearings and report on it every day for months. Um, now, we, we don't have the resources to do that anymore. Uh, once the report was out, we'd have stories about it running for weeks. Now you tend to get a, a one day wonder with one of these reports and often you're fighting to actually have a, a, a report, say the Gonski report on education. I had a real fight in my newspaper to actually just report this is what Gonski says without saying this is what people are saying about Gonski. Mm, mm. Um, so it, it has really made it very difficult to have any debate about things because people want an instantaneous answer to what's going to happen to some independent report, for example. Hmm. Just to put a different hat on, how do you think that we, the people, how, how, do, how do the people change the, the expectations track? Focus groups, uh, pollsters um, and social researchers will say that there is this great frustration in the community uh, with the media uh, because, because we do jump onto the next subject because people will be saying, hang on, I want to hear a bit more about that. I haven't, you haven't told me everything I need to know. Um, now, given the sensitivities of the way the media is now going to work, I mean, for example, uh, the Financial Review is now going online, which means that uh, every time a person clicks on a story, um, everybody in the newspaper organisation knows uh, how much interest there is. Now that's completely transformed the, um, the Financial Review's perceptions of itself and what was read and what wasn't read. So there is actually a great people power aspect to this that if the media, uh, if, if people want the media and the debate to become more civilised, that, that, that is a real vehicle for it to happen because um, the good old uh, power of money arguments are that if people, if people running news organisations see that people actually do want some quality uh, information and debate, um, assessment rather than uh, commentary, it will start to influence what they actually put in the newspapers. In a, in a completely different period of turbulence uh, in Paris in 1968, Lacan said to the students, he said, what, are you looking, what you're looking for as revolutionaries is a new master, you will get one. Mm. What sort of a master do you think we are summoning up at the moment in Australia? Well, being an eternal optimist, I hope it leads to some figure emerging who can galvanise people's... Uh, I mean, people still want to know where the country's going and that it's going somewhere good for their kids um, and that we're put, putting all the building blocks in place for that to happen. I think people still want that. And if somebody can come along and say, look, this is what we need to do to get there and you know, I'm the one to lead you and, and has this sort of self-confidence, if you like, and is able to rise above the, the sort of sense that they're, they're spending their entire time managing their own image, I think people will really warm to that. Now, we may end up getting, I mean, the, the current prospects are that we will end up getting Tony Abbott. Now, Tony Abbott is a, a very interesting character. Um, he's a, a very negative character at the moment, um, and he's got this quite eclectic view, uh, collection of views in terms of our uh, recent uh, political history. Um, but he will be a strong leader, I think, if he becomes Prime Minister. Um, people might, might not like it. The question is whether he'll be a polarising Prime Minister or whether, once he's in office, um, and out of the uh, hurly-burly of being an opposition leader, uh, he can actually transform himself into something different. And we, we've seen so many leaders do that. Um, I suppose the one I've watched, I've seen uh, do that the most is Paul Keating because it was such a violent transformation from Mr Spending Cut, uh, the end of the world is upon us if we don't fix things up, to being the expansive, republican, arts-loving, uh, Prime Minister uh, when he uh, finally toppled Bob Hawke. But I guess you, you also do make the point that he would need to confound expectations to become that sort of leader because the mm. way that things are set up now, uh, the expectation is that he'll throw over the carbon tax, the mining tax, a, a series of other reforms. Mm. 
Uh, if he does that, then he won't be that sort of strong, encompassing. Well, is, uh, I noticed he's now saying that um, uh, getting rid of the carbon tax is actually a positive agenda. So, well, <laughs> um, and I, I think that's his big dilemma. Uh, with the things that uh, seem to be propelling him into office, uh, not just the dislike of uh, Julia Gillard and Labor at the moment. I think it is this dislike of minority government, and. People will be determined next time, I think, to get a decisive outcome, so we're likely to have a polarised um, election campaign. But presuming that he wins, um, he's going to have this very negative agenda of stuff to clean up, um, which will make it very difficult for him, but it is not impossible, uh, nonetheless, for him to start embracing other attitudes and other issues to transform his public persona. And you can see that he's tried to do that along the way with the childcare policy and uh, talk about uh, nanny policies and things like that. So it'll be a fascinating period to watch. Well, I think your essay has really done a lot to, uh, to explore it, the expectations of the Australian public, a, a debate that I don't really feel that we've had very much of in recent years. Well, it's been a really fantastic experience for me too because we spend our entire lives waiting for politicians to tell us what we should think. But we don't think enough about what we think all, all by ourselves and what it is we really want, um, rather, than just being wait to, waiting to, rather than just waiting to be told. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.